Hi everyone, my name is Matthew McKenzie, um, carer from South London. Welcome to another video. Um, hopefully, I can write up a blog about what I'm just going to discuss today. <coughs> and this video really is basically about um, identifying carers, specifically um, mental health carers, those who care for someone who's suffering mental health distress or suffering a mental health illness could be schizophrenia, they could be suffering from addiction, uh, eating disorder, obsessive compulsion disorders, um, severe anxiety, severe stress, you name it. Now I'm going to tackle this video basically on identifying carers in relation to hospitals or what we could call mental health trusts. And um, I think, that, you know, to be honest, you know, there's a number of good trusts out there that work very hard to identify carers. They put a lot of effort, they put a lot of resources, and they've got a lot of drive. Not to the point where they um, <clears throat> disregard the patient or the service user. They are fighting hard to aid in the patient's recovery. But they're also fighting hard to identify carers that could be the family or the carer so this video actually is trying to tackle the issue of identifying carers from a perspective of my views and what I feel mental health trusts are, that, that are assigned to help identify carers as well now well we're now going to look at two things the first one will be when identifying the carer should be really easy and after that we'll move on to when um, ad, you know when identifying a carer is easy enough but then we get excuses and I know a lot of people are not going to like what I'm going to say but unfortunately this does happen can happen and it shouldn't really happen so we've got two things basically the carer is coming forward and saying I am the carer the patient agrees that the person's the carer perhaps they live with them if they don't there's an agreement between patient or the service user and the care themselves then we are trying to work together to resolve uh, and help the person recover from the mental health problem. The other one is on the records, if it's in the records what's, what's the problem with identification? And the last one probably would be um, if an, an, another agency probably acting on behalf of the family has identified that that person within the family or the family is the carer. So all right, let's move on to perhaps one of the most difficult part of the uh, the, this video and this would be looking at the reasons why a mental health trust would bring up excuses on why they couldn't identify carers. A good one I suppose I I tend to hear quite a lot from mental health trusts or health professionals it will be like the reason why they can't identify the carers they do. The first thing to say is, well who would you define as the carer? And it's not always easy. Now I, I do agree with that to a point, I really do. Sometimes it's not that obvious, except within perhaps if a patient was using a, your services for a long length of time, then I would start to scratch my head and, and hand, you know, saying, hang on a second, there must be at least someone out there who's trying to help the patient if they're using services for a length of time. It couldn't take that long to identify that carer. But I've heard that when someone inquires about, you know, well, okay, um, we need a system to pick up the carers, and then someone will like, well, who can you define who the carer is? Okay, it's not always that easy. And that can be used as an excuse. Oh, we, you know, we don't know what a carer is. It could be a pet dog or it could be um, the next door neighbour, well alright, what's their name? Things like that. Who is named in that record, out of several records? So, I suppose if the patient or service user first was a first time user of the services, I might expect that. But, if they've been using the system for perhaps a couple of months or so, maybe a couple of weeks, 
shouldn't really be using the excuse continually and you should most definitely be not be using the excuse for the system for on identifying carers overall because if that is the first reason why a mental health trust saying well who can you define as a carer then I certainly would be inquiring about the policy on identifying carers because it's them in some sense who they must have a policy to say this is how we identify carers they can't just come back and say well how do you know what a carer is it's their job to identify them in the first place they must have a carer database somewhere so that's one excuse uh, another excuse and this is perhaps very common is when there's an over-reliance on, on saying that the service user should say who the carer is and if you know if there's conflict within the family due to a, you know, a psychosis or an eating disorder and sometimes families and carers can pressure service users to seek treatment and that pressure can boil over into conflict so if the health professional is saying well the service user says you're not the carer something is very wrong unless of course there is some proof to say that you know you're you won't spend in a, you know, any time with the patient, you don't live with the service user. Um, there, could be, there could be other reasons, but then it's also kind of used as an excuse, as an over-reliance on the, the service user to, to decide. And this would flag up warnings, especially if the carer lives with the patient and they're attending the meetings and they're making a lot of noise to the health professional saying, look, you know, my loved one needs the, the treatment, they need help. So that's another excuse mental health trusts can use, an over-reliance on, on service users or patients to say, like, you decide who the carer is. Like, I've been in situations where, you know, my loved one say, oh, it's my next to kin. And they don't live with them. <laughs> in fact, they live very, very far. And that isn't really being that's not satisfactory, especially when the next kid says, no, I'm not the carer, and it continue to keep saying that. All right, here's another excuse. Um, and this one can really get mental health trust into a lot of trouble, and I expect in the future to see more of this. So when external bodies start to inquire um, why there's a low number of carers being identified, then it, they would mental health trust or health professional within the trust is saying well it's not stated in the records I mean, it's not there and usually that's not good enough really because all all the professionals bodies external professional bodies would do is say well okay what have you done about this you, you've said to us that there's no carers there's a low number of carers in your in your records or in your patient information records, your patient information care plans. Why is it so low? You tell us, what have you done about it? And that's when the trust will start to start, well, I would think they'll start panicking, to be honest. So there can't be an over-reliance on the records alone. Um, another one, which is more of a cultural problem in a sense, that um, due to complaints, and conflicts with the carer, mental health trust and health professionals tend to back off. They don't want to engage with the carer. Sometimes, I suppose, to be fair, it can be an educational problem on how carers should engage with the health professional. But also, health professionals should engage with families and carers. Now, if there's a lot of complaints, a lot of hostility, I understand in human nature that the social worker, the care coordinator, the nurse will back off and won't engage. That is human nature. But it can also be used as an excuse as well, as to say, oh, well, that person's too difficult to deal with, so we're not going to engage with them, we're not going to register them as the carer, because they're too hard to deal with. As I mentioned before in this video, we do, we do and can have safeguarding issues. Um, obviously, there will be clear evidence of a safeguarding risks, but then, if this is used often within a mental of trust to say, reason we can't keep identifying or why the reason why there's a low number of carers registered is because what is pointing out here is safeguarding issues all of the external bodies are going to ask is well okay why is there a high number 
of safeguarding issues regarding carers, especially if the external body is digging deep enough, finding that there's a low number of carers but there's a high safeguarding warnings or flags or, or information regarding families and carers, the same or what processes have you got regarding safeguarding, you know, mental health professional not really listening to families and carers because they think, well, they're either too involved, that's another excuse by the way, too involved, and, and the reason why I'm saying that um, that can be used as an excuse is that the reason why the carers or families are too involved is because they not getting any support so they're obviously going to make a lot more noise that that is common sense if there's lack of services lack of engagement regarding the patient's care lack of involvement from the family and care they're going to make even more noise then you hear excuse saying well they're too involved of course um i'll give i suppose the last one i'll give i suppose the last one that would be um the most horrid excuse is how it is but I want to try and keep this video short and that would be saying this is the most laziest one I can come across is that no one referred the carer to us and that's got to be a horrendous excuse anyway I'm looking forward to um, finding another video at a later date and feel free to check out my website or my blog site regarding mental health carers and sometimes just mental health in general Thanks for stopping by and hope to see you again soon.